Hello, my name is Justin Clement. I'm hosting uh, today's event of the, the Lunch and Learn Summer Series. And we have a, a fairly exciting discussion today, uh, kind of a, a round table event with the muster roll team. And we're asking the question, was your ancestor at Valley Forge, <laughs> right? This is uh, the discussion today and we're looking at the muster roll project. Uh, but of course this is run by the Valley Forge Park Alliance. We have other events that are coming up. We invite you to visit uh, the Valley Forge Park Alliance website to look uh, up future events. Lunch and Learn will be every single week, Wednesday at noon between now and August 11th. So uh, please, uh, if you would keep Lunch and Learn in mind as we go forward throughout the summer, uh, and we invite you to, to join us for future talks as well. Uh, but for right now, I'm going to pass things over to Michelle Murphy uh, with the Muster Roll Project, and uh, she's going to kick things off for us. Welcome, Michelle. All right. All right. Um, good afternoon, and welcome to this presentation on the Muster Roll Project. Uh, we'd like to thank the Valley Forge Park Alliance and uh, Justin Clement for everything he does for the Lunch and Learn program and for moderating. Uh, the Muster Roll Project team consists of six members, myself, Mary Lynn Person, Karis Coker, Susan Rizone, and two other valuable members, Alan Witkowski and David Fisher. So, was your ancestor at the encampment at Valley Forge? Have you ever researched who your ancestors were and where they came from? Especially for those in this area, you may find that you actually do have an ancestor that was at the encampment. So let's talk briefly about the Valley Forge encampment. Here we show the beautiful painting by William Trago, The March to Valley Forge, which was hanging in the Valley Forge Visitor Center, but now is at the Museum of the American Revolution. Trego's inspiration was a passage from Washington Irving's Life of George Washington. Sad and dreary was the march to Valley Forge, uncheered by the recollection of any recent triumph. Hungry and cold were the poor fellows who had so long been keeping the field. Provisions were scant, clothing was worn out, and so badly were they off for shoes that the footsteps of many might be tracked in blood. And here we can see that the depiction shows men without shoes and torn clothing. Valley Forge was the third winter encampment of the Revolutionary War. It was chosen because the British occupied Philadelphia and the Continental Army could still be near and keep an eye on them from Mount Joy and Mount Misery. Plus, there were spacious areas where they could train. While they were there, Valley Forge became the fourth largest city of 2,000 huts. It housed approximately 12,000 soldiers and 400 women and children. People from all walks of life were there, including those from all of the 13 colonies, Canada, England, France, African Americans, and Native Americans. Nearly 2,000 died due to disease, smallpox, typhoid, dysentery, and pneumonia. But the Continental Army persevered and was retrained under General Baron von Steuben. Some soldiers unfortunately did leave camp and went back to their homes, but for those that stayed, they emerged as a cohesive and disciplined fighting force, strong enough to overcome the British Redcoats, the greatest military unit at that time. How did that happen? A lot of the success was due to George Washington himself. He inspired his troops with his own resilience and sense of duty. Today, Valley Forge remains a source of inspiration for Americans and the world. If these troops can get through that tough winter, we can overcome our obstacles too. It evokes the spirit of patriotism and independence. These individuals were true patriots. They loved their new country and believed in the cause of liberty. Valley Forge represents individual and collective sacrifice. They gave up everything, left their homes, families, and land to fight for liberty together side by side with others who believed as well. 
It demonstrates resolve, tenacity, and determination of people to be free. Even though there were losses at Brandywine and Germantown, and the Conway Cabal was trying to take down Washington, he was a true leader and never gave up. And he inspired his troops to keep fighting. So what exactly is a muster roll? It's a monthly document that the Continental Army used to track the Army's strength. Each roll has names, ranks, dates of enlistment, and other notes on soldiers' assignments, activities, or conditions. But these just aren't names on an old piece of paper. They're history, and they mean something. For example, here we have a muster roll of Captain Charles McHenry of the 5th Pennsylvania Regiment, commanded by Colonel Francis Johnston in March of 1778. And we see sergeants, corporals, drum and fife, and the privates. And we see Michael McCoy was on guard, Charles Wallington was on fatigue, and many of the soldiers were in the hospital. And this is one key document that we use to verify that a soldier was actually at Valley Forge. And you can see Valley Forge here in the corner. Another key document that we use is a company muster roll card. And here is Charles Wallington's muster roll card. And you can see that he was at Valley Forge in March of 1778 and he was on fatigue. The Valley Forge Muster Roll Project, a project of the Valley Forge Park Alliance, is dedicated to those who were at winter quarters from December 19, 1777 to June 19, 1778. An all volunteer group, we verified that individuals were indeed present at the encampment. We answer questions sent in from those who cannot find their ancestors or, or who may need additional help. And this research often leads to remarkably interesting stories of those from all walks of life who gave up everything to fight for our liberty. The history of the muster roll. The first muster roll was initiated in 1941, but the idea of gathering information from 18th century muster rolls and make them available electronically was spearheaded in 1992 by the late Tom McNichol and Frank Rosavi two longtime volunteers who gave a tremendous amount of time and passion to this project. They sought to create a list of the Continental soldiers who were at Valley Forge for at least one day. This is still used as our core criterion. Lockheed Martin Nova volunteers assisted with building a special database electronically catalog, the, the muster roll, and helped to create the muster roll website. Lockheed Martin also purchased kiosks and computers for the park for use by visitors. Thank you Lockheed Martin and Nova volunteers. There are now over 34,000 names on the muster roll today. How to find your ancestor. If you visit the muster roll website at valleyforgemusterroll.org and look for search the muster roll, you can enter the soldier or individual's last name or a portion of the last name, and you can also combine it with a state or regiment to refine your search. If you have trouble, contact us at musterroll at vfparkalliance.org, and a volunteer can help answer your questions if for anyone who needs additional help. Information found on the Valley Forge muster roll has been compiled from original muster rolls payroll records, pensions, letters or orders, and other primary documents of the Revolutionary War. Many valuable records have been lost over time and therefore our muster roll will never be considered complete. And it, of course, if you have any additional information to, to what is listed on the roll, please contact us. We encourage and value any input. So what are the requirements for a, a new addition to the website or to the muster roll? 
we require primary documentation for all new additions. Such documents include a payroll stub, an application for a pension, discharge papers, or additional or original muster roll records. Contact us if you have additional information to add or correct about your ancestor. A great website to find such documentation is fold3.com. And now I'll hand it over to Susan Razone to talk about the muster roll products. Um, I'll interject uh, for just a moment. Uh, we did have a question, and since you mentioned Fold3, uh, the, the question was, uh, can you see these original muster roll documents uh, online? Now, uh, Fold3.com uh, is one of those places where you can see the, the muster rolls that are held by the National Archives. Uh, there are various state archives, however, that are repositories of uh, these muster rolls. Uh, a lot of the Massachusetts uh, muster rolls, for example, are kept, uh, uh, they're, they're on microfilm, but uh, I believe it's Family Search, um, which uh, has uh, those microfilm um, on, online that uh, you can see digitally. Uh, does anyone else have anything to add about that? All right, we might get to that, uh, that part later. All right, anyway, carry on, please. All right, on to the muster roll products. We have some amazing products for purchase and all purchases benefit the ongoing support of the muster roll project and the legacy of the December 1777 to June 1778 encampment of the Continental Army. These are uh, products that, one, we have an official certifi certification of service, and that's if you have confirmed your ancestor was at Valley Forge and are indeed being added to the muster roll, you can then order this uh, cert certificate and hang it on your wall proudly to say you are part of the history of uh, the brave people who fought for our freedom, really. So that's a very nice, uh, you know, when you find that you have confirmed your ancestor, you can order the official muster roll certificate or the official muster roll mug, which I was just sitting here just sipping on my tea, wishing I had an ancestor at Valley Ford <laughs> so I could have one. We may need to talk about making a mug for the general public who doesn't have a confirmed ancestor because I'm an enthusiast and I'd like my own mug, quite frankly. Um, so that's something, these are gifts you can buy for yourself, for a relative, uh, to share the excitement of your ancestor being a Valley Forge, or even if you're simply just an enthusiast who appreciates all the sacrifices made and you wanna share something maybe to pass on with the next generation, someone to say, this is something special, hold on to this. So on that note, we also have a beautiful pewter Continental Army USA pin. And that's something that you could multi-gift to your, these are great stocking stuffers, or if you're gonna take someone on a trip to Valley Forge, send it to them in advance and say, this is an excitement of what you're gonna go see, learn and experience. So definitely these are affordable gifts. These are gifts for everybody. You do not need an ancestor to be confirmed. <clears throat> at Valley Forge to order that beautiful uh, Continental Army US, USA pin. Now we get into the products that are really for the enthusiast, someone you want to support and, you know, someone who enjoys watching how all of this laid out and how we gain the track to our liberty. And we start off by learning more about the encampment uh, at Valley Forge and having an encampment map. Again, this is a great product to buy for yourself, for your office, or for a history enthusiast because people love looking at this, tracking how this all laid out. This was, uh, you know, an art in motion as we created our Continental Army in Valley Forge. There's also taking it another level covering more wall space, but definitely exciting for the person who's into this. The Continental Army uh, basically 
it's a graph of how it was reorganized at Valley Forge, breaking it down by division, by state, and really laying it out to see how this power uh, structure structured itself. And again, these are nice gifts for yourself or someone else. These are gifts that you, you're not gonna just find on Amazon and have the legitimacy of knowing this is gonna support the muster roll project. We have so many amazing books. And one of the uh, books that we just worked on as a group in our muster roll project was revising, um, uh, well, we'll get to that. This one, the first book we're gonna talk about is uh, The Chronology of the American Revolution. Again, a very nice uh, found book. And then we also have The Continental Army, Valley Forge, 1777 to 7078. This is the one we just revised. This is the second edition. And it is fascinating just going through it. I can't believe all the information. There's so much to learn here. And this really lays it out in a succinct manner where you can even see the, you know, the counts of who was there and it's just a great book to have uh, for those of you who want the facts in your hands. Sometimes it's better to hold it in your hands sometimes and just read it on the internet because you can page back and forth. Then we have our new edition product. And this again, great gift. This could, is a gift in itself or you could throw it into a stocking stuffer, but that is our new muster roll magnet. This is something I want on my refrigerator as well. It's a, um, it depicts Washington and Steuben reviewing the troops at Valley Forge, which there's so much history in that one image. We as a group could go on with Lunch and Learns for a whole nother year or, or so, <laughs> talking about the history in that image. So again, powerful image and a way to maybe pique someone's interest, maybe a younger generation say, hey, look at this, this, this holds a lot of value. Do you know what the muster roll is? So. And then we also sell beautiful Valley Forge images um, and they are made by an award-winning artist, Michael Tacchino. Am I saying that correctly? Okay. And you can find all of these prints and prices. That's our beautiful covered bridge that you're looking at right now. You can find all of these on our valleyforgemusterroll.org for prints and prices. And you can also go and shop for these products on the Valley Forge Alliance website. I appreciate your time and I will pass this on now to Karis. Karis, you may want to unmute. Thank you. <laughs> uh, the certificate's in the mugs, Susan. Uh, you don't have to, as you said, be a descendant to purchase those. I've bought them as gifts. I'm not honored myself to be a descendant of the Army at Valley Forge, but uh, I've purchased them as gifts for folks that I knew who were. So anyone can order one of well, them. Thank you for letting me know that because now I know the first person getting some gifts. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, to our audience uh, a longtime partner of the Valley Forge Park Alliance, and that is the Society of the Descendants. Uh, could we go down to the next? Okay. Um, the Society of the Descendants of Washington's Army at Valley Forge. And the Alliance is very thankful for their continued support and partnership. And we share a gratitude for the sacrifice and the success, ultimately, of the Continental Army. And we share an appreciation for their commander, General Washington, and his leadership, which I really appreciated, Michelle, what you had to say about uh, General Washington. Uh, so to the next slide, please. Thank you. The Society of the Descendants of Washington's Army at Valley Forge is a historical and genealogical organization dedicated to honoring the men and women of the encampment at Valley Forge. And yes, they do have members who are descended from women who were at Valley Forge. To, for membership, one must prove their descent from a person that spent time at Valley Forge with the Continental Army from December the 19th of 77 
through to the march out of June 1978, but it's uh, only required that a person have been there at one day. I think the requirement for the descendants is the same as for the muster roll. The uh, Society of the Descendants was formed in 1976, the bicentennial year of the Declaration of Independence, and the same year that the Friends of Valley Forge Park, which is now the Valley Forge Park Alliance, were formed. Uh, the Valley Forge Park Alliance was officially organized then, but really its roots went all the way back, do go all the way back to the very first uh, Centennial and Memorial Association that was uh, organized to purchase Washington's headquarters. And that was the beginning of what we now have as the Valley Forge National Historical Park. And so we have a great legacy to maintain. And part of that is our ongoing partnership with the Valley Forge or with the uh, Society. 2006 was the beginning of that partnership. And each summer, we look forward to their annual encampment at the Valley Forge Park to celebrate their year's accomplishments and to tour the park and various sites in the area that are related to their history. And this year, in 2021, it's going to be a virtual visit uh, and we'll miss having them in the park and being able to visit with them at the ordinary reception. But we look forward to next year and hope that they we can be reunited once again next year. So the society invites friends and family to join the descendants of Valley Forge and to on you can as Susan had mentioned, you can honor your patriot by the items that are purchased and. You can go to their website, um, thevalleyforgesociety.com and get more information on how to join. And as noted here, information from the DAR and SAR can be cited as proof of your descendancy and your relationship. And, but all applications um, accepted electronically to limit the amount of photocopying and, pay, uh, and mailing. You can get those details there on their website, but, at the muster roll, we are especially appreciative of their support um, and their mission and ours is very closely uh, lined up. So now I will turn it over to Mary Lynn Person who has some amazing stories to tell you. Okay, yes I do. As we um, go about researching folks for the muster roll, we get questions and we get family stories and some um, legends that we have to sort through to make sure that uh, these people were actually there because we want to honor them. So um, recently I came across these stories. Um, Jonathan Todd Jr. Can I have the next slide? Thank you. Jonathan Todd was a surgeon's mate and he was in the 7th Connecticut Regiment, Captain Heman Swift's company. Jonathan was studying to be a physician when he enlisted in the Continental Army in August of 1777. He studied under his father, who was a physician. He wrote many letters to his father during the time he was with the Army, many of which described conditions at Valley Forge, such as building the huts and um, the, what they were eating and what Christmas dinner was. Um, very interesting letters to read. Um, so on December 26th, 1777, the day after Christmas, he wrote, and what is on your screen right now is the actual uh, letter that he wrote to his father, a part of it. Um, he wrote, Jethro, a Negro from Guilford, belonging to Captain Hall's company, died in his tent. The first man that hath died in camp belonging to our regiment. And actually, it was the first man that died at Valley Forge. Um, so we don't know anything more about that, that uh, soldier that died, but... Um, he was memorialized in this letter from Jonathan to his father. I have the next slide. 
James Harris. <clears throat> He's kind of an interesting guy. James Harris was a free man of color. So he was a black African-American who was free. He was born around 1752 in Virginia. He enlisted at 21 years old and is described in his enlistment papers as being five foot four and a half inches tall with black hair, hazel eyes, and a yellow complexion. He was residing in Dinwiddie, Virginia. He initially enlisted in the 5th Virginia in 1777 in place of a draftee, George Rilla. So the question is, did he get paid to enlist in the place of this gentleman? Was he forced? How, how did that happen? I suspect he probably was paid, but we don't know. Um, and he was transferred to the 15th Virginia while he was at Valley Forge. He was assigned during the time that he was at Valley Forge to be an orderly to Major James Monroe, future president, as was president with Major Monroe at the Battle of Monmouth. After the war, James Harris was a cooper by trade. And in 1818, he applied for a pension citing age, infirmity, infirmity, I'm sorry, and the inability to support his family. In his pension request was a statement, which we can see in the pension request, from James Monroe attesting to his service. So he was kind of an interesting guy. And the next slide. Polly Cooper. So Polly Cooper, in addition to the Continental Army soldiers, others were at the Valley Forge encampment. For example, an Oneida woman named Polly Cooper. Polly, along with several members of the United tribe, traveled over 200 miles from Fort Stanwyck in New York to Valley Forge, carrying bushels of dry white corn to help feed General Washington's starving troops. They brought several hundred bushels at about 70 pounds per bushel and the route was no easy one. Although this would not be enough to feed the entire army, this was considered a great deed by the Oneida. The corn they brought was white corn and different from the local yellow corn. The white corn required extended preparation before it could be readily digested. And the soldiers, when they saw the food, the corn and the bushels, and they were starving, they started to grab at the corn and they were gonna eat the corn and Polly came along and she said, no, uh, uh you can't do that. You can't just eat this corn. It's gonna kill you because it's gonna get in your stomach and it's gonna expand and you could die. So she spent time teaching the soldiers how to, how to prepare this corn. And um, she stayed on for a little while after um, the other Anitas left to continue helping to feed and teach the, the soldiers. And there, this photo here is a, um, a photo of a sculpture in the American Indian Museum in Washington, DC, honoring Polly Cooper and Chief Shenandoah for their contrib contribution to the American fight for independence. So those are my three interesting stories for this year. Next year, when we do another one, Shin Learn, I'll have more stories for you. Next slide. So, should you want to find out about your ancestor or have us help you with your research, you can contact us at musterall at valleyforgeparkalliance.org or you can write to us, Valley Forge Park Alliance, Post Office Box 117, Valley Forge, Pennsylvania 19481. And please check out the website. Look for your ancestor, valleyforgemusterroll.org. Do we have questions? Uh, we do. And uh, I invite uh, the viewers uh, to ask any additional questions. Um, since we were on the subject of Polly Cooper, uh, I do want to uh, bring up a few observations. Uh, okay. One, there is a traditional gift exchange economy. Uh, and, uh, you know, the 
the corn that was brought uh, by the Oneida. Uh, this is all part of an oral tradition uh, with the Oneida Nation. And uh, there are many instances in which oral histories have uh, shown details that uh, are, are fairly uh, uh, reliable that uh, may not be reflected in the written record. And this may be one of those moments. Uh, what's uh, interesting is that the gift of corn uh, uh, to the Continental Army, uh, this actually uh, also implies that uh, the receiver uh, is in some form of debt to them. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. so they're it, gift exchange, right? So they're giving this very important gift, uh, you know, of food in such a, a, a time when it was needed. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, the Continental Army and the United States itself owes something to the United Nation in return, right? So it's uh, an interesting uh, uh, observation. Uh, it's rooted in tradition. Uh, and, uh, you know, in, in this case, uh, with this being part of the, the oral history record of that community, uh, the fact that the, the gift exchange economy is uh, such a, a well-documented uh, event, uh, that part of it uh, does ring true in many regards. Um, all right, so we have uh, a few questions and uh, let's go through them. So the first is, how do you keep track or do you keep track of which documents that you use to verify an individual's presence at Valley Forge? Um, I guess I can take that. Um, basically, we um, get emails or letters from folks asking for, you know, to see if their ancestor was on the muster roll. Anything they send us, we print out and keep together with the original request. And anything we find in, in a, you know, helping them to, to uh, get the documentation they need. Um, we clip it all together and it's on file in our mustural office. Uh, I also want to point out that uh, if you are looking at an individual record on the Mustaroll project, that uh, there's often on uh, the right hand side uh, a chart uh, with uh, uh, monthly entries. And on occasion, you might see on roll or on roll without comment or um, you know, at hospital, you know, various notations that might have appeared on the original muster rolls. Um, and um, sometimes that information will, will tell you whether or not uh, they appear on muster rolls. Um, but uh, yeah, of course, uh, going in and seeing the original muster roll is uh, a, a very good thing to do. So re related to that, um, let me ask you, um, how often do you actually have to inspect original muster rolls when, when you're going through and verifying information? Um, always. <laughs> <laughs> if yeah, and anyone can answer this. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, if they're available, we want to see them because that's really what puts them at Valley Forge. Um, so they're very important and we try when they are available. They're not always, but we pretty much always look at mustrels. But um, also, uh, when I had mentioned that uh, some um, state mustrels might be uh, available, uh, do you have people uh, submitting mustrels that may not be part of the National Archives collection that uh, they submit as evidence that they've come across? Have you encountered that at all? We have on occasion. It's not um, not as often as, as the ones from Fold 3 or the National Archives, but occasionally we do find one. I think there was one just recently that sent in. Does anybody remember? But occasionally we do, yes. Especially like from Pennsylvania and places where they really do have records. <laughs> May I ask uh, that uh, first individual you brought up, Jonathan Todd, uh, that letter that he had written home, mm -hmm. uh, where, uh, where was that record found? Was that part of uh, his pension application? Um, I believe that's where we found the actual, yeah, document. Uh, there are other places where you can find um, the letters that he wrote. 
I don't remember exactly where I found it. We missed it. Well, today we've got a complete. Oh. Don't let them. <laughs> All right, we have a, another question. Um, this is uh, from an individual who was asking about uh, uh, trying to figure out how, when you have people with multiple names, how do you determine whether it is your ancestor? So we had a talk last night as part of the speaker series uh, and uh, it's one of the things that he addressed, which was how do you know if this John Smith is my John Smith? you know, uh, when you have multiple names that come up. Um, so is there a, a short answer to that? <laughs> <laughs> no, there's not a short answer to that. <laughs> so you, you really have to look at every name and, you know, Ma Mary Lynn, I'll toss it back to you because you really have done a lot of this. Yeah, I mean, basically you have to go back into the genealogy. You have to... Um, you have to go and look at where they were from, where each individual soldier was from. Um, so comparing um, information, I mean, I will often put things in an Excel spreadsheet and just, you know, line up this guy versus that guy and, and check for the um, similarities or discrepancies. Sometimes we, it's clear cut and we can figure it out quickly. Other times um, it takes a while. And um, there's been a couple of occasions where we've gone on for months trying to sort this out with, with the individual that's requesting the information. Um, we do our best. We search everywhere we can um, and um, communicate back and forth with folks so that um, we keep them informed as to what we're finding and what they can provide us with that might help. So it's a collaborative. And Susan, you had a request that had how many different spellings? <laughs> yeah. it, probably, I would say, six or seven different spellings. And the way we listed, well, we will be updating on our new system. This uh, soldier is, we're going to list him under the spelling of the muster roll card we have at Valley Forge and then list the alternative spellings. And then going back and taking it one step further on top of what Mary Lynn said, if you have a Tom Smith and you're tracing this person back, you go back through the pension, even the pension requests to see who's writing in for those pension requests and then doing the genealogy backtracking to make sure that's the right Tom Smith in that, you know, depending on who wrote for the pension, these are all just, now we always stick with the primary source, uh, which would be the muster roll card. But in, in those situations, we can, we call it going down the rabbit hole. <laughs> you hear a lot of, you find that a lot of stories and sometimes you realize you're in the wrong Tom Smith family and you have to go back and start again from fold three and, and start backtracking again. But there's all sorts of other ways. But yes, we go through, and spelling, it's not uncommon. It's actually rather frequent that you'll see the same soldier and they'll miss, they'll change the spelling of the name, essentially on whoever's writing that muster roll card for the day. So you just, you kind of follow it and you can see it's the same person. And you can even almost see sometimes from the language, from the writing, how the last person thought there was an E in the name and it's simply because of a curly Q writing style. So that's just, that's all I'll say there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, spelling is um, not consistent in the 18th century. And part of that is because a lot of the soldiers were not literate. So they didn't know how their name was spelled. They, um, so they would spell it the way it sort of sounded at the time. Um, if you were Scottish, it was different than if you were German because you know, uh, or the person recording it was Scottish or German and they it came out different. Um, and so a lot of times we get requests from people who want us to change the spelling of their um, ancestor's name on the muster roll and they want the current spelling, the spelling that the family is using now. And we sometimes have to tell them that we are going to use the spelling 
that's on the mustrels most commonly at the at the time of Valley Forge or, or during the Revolutionary War. Uh, last night we did have a, a speaker series guest um, with uh, the Valley Forge Park Alliance, uh, Brendan Burns, who is a genealogist with the National Society Daughters of the American Revolution. And the one thing he said in terms of trying to sort out which ancestor is yours versus someone of the same name is try to tie it to locality. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, uh, your, your regiments and companies uh, can be tied to locality as well. So uh, that is one of the best ways to try and sort that information out. Um, that uh, was recorded, uh, so maybe check back in the fall uh, with uh, our, our YouTube website and uh, that might be posted, uh, which has uh, some additional tips that, that are worthy of consideration. Yeah. yeah, that was a really good talk. Uh, we have another question. Um, do we have people who are in the flying camps of the Pennsylvania militia on the muster roll? So for those who aren't familiar, flying camps, uh, these are uh, often uh, you'll have uh, terms come up. Uh, these are very temporary camps. Uh, they're not like a, a permanent garrison where you have huts that are being built uh, for the winter season. Uh, or maybe they are very far ahead of the main army. Like you, you will have um, an advance guard that may set up temporary camp away from the main army. So you have those kinds of phrases. So when it comes to, to flying camps, uh, how do you define Valley Forge, uh, the Valley Forge encampment, uh, when it comes to inclusion or exclusion uh, with the Valley Forge muster roll project? Well, if they were in camp for one day, we can put them on the muster roll. And I think some of them were, they would come through Valley Forge. I know, I know I researched and again, it's not coming to mind exactly who it was, but I've done research on the flying camps and um, some of them did come through uh, and stay briefly at Valley Forge. And some if they, they have, have yeah. yeah. And if they have the primary documentation right. to support it, then we are more than happy to put them on the master roll. So we just need that documentation. Yeah. So the, the Valley Forge encampment had all kinds of satellite uh, groups uh, that were around. Uh, the Yellow Springs Hospital, right? Yellow Springs, it, it is outside the main Valley Forge encampment, but it is nearby. Uh, there, there were hospitals uh, all over the place. Trenton, uh, you have uh, Afrata, uh, which is, I, I believe it's, uh, what, between York and Reading? Uh, but uh, it is, what, 40 miles away? A, a fairly good distance. So uh, these different satellite uh, encampments, uh, they, they are regrettably outside, uh, you know, the, the main encampment of Valley Forge. Uh, but uh, it doesn't mean that uh, these militia didn't pass through. So if you can find that kind of information, right, if you have a militiaman, you, you, you want to tie to Valley Forge, you know, do your best and try to dig up that kind of documentation. Yeah, we do have a few uh, militia folks on, on the muster roll for various reasons. But yeah, yeah. they're not generally there, but occasionally. What's the strangest case that you found? You know, like uh, <laughs> an example where you were able to prove it, but it was kind of uh, unexpected uh, in the way that you were finally able to document it. Anybody want that one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Samuel Lapsley in the 12th Virginia. I, I thought you knew I was going to say that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that was one of my most <laughs> original ones, I think, um, corresponding with a gentleman in North Carolina who um, was doing research on Samuel Lapsley and his company, who was a captain, um, and um, all of the fellows that were with him. And we went back and forth a lot about that one. I've been corresponding with him for like eight months now. Um, trying to figure it out. Where was 
Samuel Lapsley, was he with a Maryland? We have him on the muster roll as being with Mar the third Maryland, but he wasn't with the third Maryland. And we don't know how he got on the muster roll with the third Maryland. So we needed to change that, but that was a very interesting project and it's still kind of on ongoing now, but we do get, we really get into this. I mean, we really get involved and we want to make it right. So that's one. Anybody else have a good one? I would say that's the one that we keep talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Samuel Lapsley. Mm -hmm. But it isn't uncommon for someone to write in and say, you know, my ancestor was a colonel or, you know, and then we have to write back and say, actually, I had that one soldier who was a colonel, but then took a step back to private. Mm -hmm. And when he was at Valley, and that happened for a variety of reasons, nothing to defame the soldier, but there was all sorts of politics and logistics of moving around the regiments as well. But I, when I had a reply to the uh, descendants, I said, well, actually, we're going to list them as a private because, again, this is what it's stated on the muster roll at Valley Forge. Mm -hmm. So all sorts of interesting stories, and you can watch the soldier in and out of the hospital. You're living vicariously through this person, like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe how much they sacrificed. Mm -hmm. So whether they make the muster roll or not at Valley Forge, we're still very grateful. Uh, Michelle, what's the total number now that's on the muster roll? Because with just having to be at the Valley Forge encampment for one day, that means that the total that's uh, entitled to be listed on the muster roll far exceeds the number that marched out or marched in because there was a turnover and folks passing through. So what is that number now? Yes, it's over 34,000. That's remarkable. It is. It's remarkable. It is. And um, I don't know if it's been mentioned along the way, but individuals who want to support the muster roll can um, go to the website and make a contribution and have their name added to the honorary muster roll, which is sup a support, contemporary support of the work of maintaining and uh, in increasing the muster roll. So, yes, absolutely. So uh, any last questions uh, from the audience, uh, please put them in the, in the Q&A. Uh, I will tell a little anecdote of my own, uh, but uh, recently uh, I acquired uh, uh, photos of uh, an orderly book from uh, the 6th North Carolina Regiment. And uh, at one point, it, uh, the, the individual uh, stops listing uh, all the, the general orders that are, are coming out and it turns into a diary. And he describes his process of being inoculated with the smallpox and he's getting purges constantly. And uh, at one point, all the doctors more or less pronounced him a dead man, <laughs> but, but he pulled through and uh, yeah, and uh, eventually uh, continued on uh, with the army. So. It's, it's fascinating sometimes these, these stories, uh, the, the amount of uh, hardship that they endured. Uh, in this case, he, he nearly went blind uh, uh, during, uh, during his sickness. So it, uh, it, is, it is remarkable, these, these personal stories. And uh, we're always grateful when people come in and share their, the stories that they discover with us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And i just like to say, I know Andy had put on the chat about Tom McNichol. Tom McNichol was a wonderful man, and his passion and love for the muster roll was just outstanding, and uh, so was Frank's. Um, this muster roll is a, just a tribute to, to their love for Valley Forge National Historic Park, the Rangers, the staff, everybody who contributes to, to the park, to the Alliance, and those men poured their heart and soul into this project. I know Tom was a Marine, he loved the service, and, and he valued America and everything about it, and 
this was his life and he loved it. Didn't he have an old hat that was his when he was in the Marine Corps that he would wear on special occasions that was yes. quite tattered and, and uh, worn? Yes. Mm -hmm. But yeah. So he's missed. We're, we're, we're proud to carry on their, their legacy. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. It took six of us to fill two people's shoes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. that's not even reflecting on who actually came to Valley Forge and why, why we're here and what we're talking about. <laughs> and, and thank you, Justin, for all you do to help and to give us guidance as well, because you always throw us some great tidbits and we greatly appreciate it. Oh, you're quite welcome. And I'm, I'm very I'm proud to be part of uh, the Valley Forge Park Alliance and uh, to help out in the ways that I can. So the, the Must Roll project, uh, I'm excited to see what directions uh, you take it in in the future. So thank you all for everything that you do. And, uh, and of course, uh, thank you for all the, the participants uh, who uh, are the, the audience who joined us today. Uh, do keep an eye out for future Lunch and Learn uh, topics. Uh, they will all appear on the events page of the Valley Forge Park Alliance website. So please visit that. And uh, yeah, in closing, uh, thank you all very much and have a good day. Take care.